Libertarians love to talk about faulty designs and incentives and such. To what extent do you reckon, oh, perfectly haired editor-in-chief, uh, does our political and governance dysfunction derive from our kind of uh, kind of architectural design flaws or bad rules? Yeah, I mean, I guess I want to start by being a little warm and fuzzy and saying that our political function, to the extent that it is successful, derives from our design. And so I want to like props to the founders for getting most of it right. Um, so let's start there. But the partisan dysfunction that we are seeing now absolutely could be ameliorated. It could be at least um, it could be like less painful for all parties with some tweaks to the process. So, yes, I do think um, the way that our election, uh, the structures of our elections have evolved over time. Um, they are not inevitable. We could be doing a lot of these things differently and that there are some places where we're doing it differently would produce outcomes that, I mean, it, you could, the trouble of course is that there are many different things you might be looking to maximize. So one might be like more democratic outcomes and one might be more orderly outcomes and one might be speedier results. And so that kind of part of the issue here is like no one even agrees what we're maximizing for, much less how to maximize it. Um, that said, there are some of these proposals to kind of fix our elections, as people often say, that I do like. Uh, Nick, you yes. surely fondly recall uh, when we were touring around America, our book, The Declaration oh of God, Independence, yeah. How Libertarian... My God. It's that was a different country, Matt. It was, in fact, a different country, but a lot. It's the same John Cougar Mellencamp, uh, thank God, and Bob Seger. Yeah. Um, uh, but a lot of people at the question and answer, this was like the third most popular question. Uh, was, uh, yeah. don't you think that if we did fill in the blank, it would uh, fix yeah. everything? What is your sense of um, that there is uh, uh, that, that that X percentage of our problems are design flaws? I am going to, uh, I think, go against probably the consensus of the three of you and say very little. Mm -hmm. It is this is not an architectural design. The house is built and it was standing for, you know, a couple hundred years the dysfunction, and it may not be that, but the, the polarization and the issues we're seeing now isn't because we don't have representative government and elections that get us there. It's because we do have representative government and elections that get us there. There is no consensus on what the government should be doing and how we should be living as a country. And our elections and our politics reflect that. Um, there are tweaks that could make things better or worse. I, for one, you know, I want to see more candidates from a broader range of, uh, you know, positions, but they're going to be housed within the Republican Democratic parties uh, or the t whatever the two major parties happen to be. So I don't, you know, I think we're looking at a, a bug, uh, you know, that's actually a feature. I don't even know why I said that, but, <laughs> you know, we, we disagree, we disagree on, um, you know, what government should be doing. We have two parties that are as ossified and fossilized as the presidential candidates running them and the former Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi, who is like, she will be mistaken if she ever goes to the Louvre, they will put her on a fucking pedestal as a mummy. Mitch McConnell has been, you know, he's the Karen Ann Quinlan of American politics. We have a leadership that absolutely reflects bad politics bad parties, and we are to blame. So I think Nick is right there to a degree, but let me push back just a little bit. I don't think that we have a design flaw in uh, sort of the, the fundamentals of our constitution, but I do think that there was a misapprehension, uh, an, an incorrect expectation on the part of the founders about how American government would operate at the federal level. And so they designed a system, as we know, with three independent branches. And what they thought was that the competition in government would be between those independent branches. And instead, over the years in particular, in the last 50 years, we have seen the competition develop so that it is a partisan competition rather than a, a rather than the branches trying to sort of check each other. And that has created some distorted incentives. And then in addition, in the 1980s, the Supreme Court made a, uh, a somewhat less uh, not very well known ruling that is now actually going to be back at the Supreme Court this year that I think was very consequential in exacerbating that. And that was... Uh, in a case uh, versus Chevron, and they, they developed a doctrine known as Chevron deference. And what Chevron deference does is it basically says that when courts are ruling on administrative, on uh, the government agency interpretations of, of the law, 
courts have to accept the government agency's interpretation if that interpretation is reasonable. And reasonable is a very um, uh, that casts a very wide net. Right. There's a lot of things that are sort of like, eh, that seems reasonable enough. That doesn't seem completely bonkers crazy. And so what that does is it incentivizes the administrative branch, the, the executive branch and the agencies to create all of these uh, to sort of to go far beyond the, 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 the text of the statutes that govern them and to do a bunch of stuff and then to present to courts. Well, here is a reasonable interpretation. And then the court's hands are tied. And then in addition, because the executive branch has an incentive to do more and to sort of take on more, Congress has less of an incentive to solve those problems and to do the business of democracy and to actually sort of say, what here's what we're going to, you know, here is what the law says and here's what we're going to do. What does that have to do with elections? I'm, and I'm not being obtuse. I mean, I the administrative state is an issue, but it's like, you know, in terms of elections, uh, you know, is this the reason why Gavin Newsom is governor of California and Ron DeSantis is governor of Florida or why Joe Biden ended up becoming the Democratic nominee, uh, et cetera? I, I'm so not really. This is the not the only issue. This is not like I said, I, I think the system was basically designed right. And and the thing that it has to do with elections is it places more power in the executive branch places more importance on the presidency because the executive branch is in effect making law by interpreting law that then the courts cannot uh, by the, because of, of Chevron deference, the courts cannot say that's a completely ridiculous interpretation or that's just the wrong one. We're gonna um, we're we're not going to accept that. And so, by placing more importance on the executive branch, it disempowers the legislative branch. And so, at the margins, that reduces the competition between the branches and means that people that Congress has less incentive to do legislative work and much more incentive for, for example, um, uh, backbenchers to just try to make a name for themselves and sort of act out, right, and just sort of use Congress as a, a media platform rather than as a place to go and write legislation that is going to be different. And that changes elections. That changes how people think about who they are going to vote for and which votes uh, matter and, and how they are sort of think about their incentives as voters, because everything ends up getting kicked up to the presidency and Congress is just sort of sits there and doesn't even pass budgets. It raises the stakes for the executive catastrophically and lowers the stakes for Congress catastrophically. Yeah, I think I think to answer uh, Nick's question further um, is that oh, Peter's talking about the federal government. And this also points to uh, a, a feature of American politics that I think doesn't get enough um, consideration, which is that when we talk about politics generally, when we chatter uh, and and write about it. It's usually federal, and it's usually the gap between the president doing his stuff and the backbenchers being clowns. And um, and there's a big difference between that and what happens in the state and local level. Um, and there's a big difference in the in I think the consequences of what happens when you have a Democratic or Republican governor uh, or legislature on the state level. Uh, the gap between policy is much more uh, striking. Um, and be but because we're so fixated on the president and that uh, we tend to think about that when we go vote for our state and local, even though the consequences are all kind of different and scrambled. I'm going to it has federalized the politics and uh, people are just voting down the ticket. But and also uh, to, to Matt's point, it is not an accident that the best and that's not to say good, but the best governance uh, the best policy governance in the United States right now is almost entirely coming from governor's offices and state houses. That was a clip from the latest Reason Roundtable. If you want to see more clips, go here. If you want to see the whole episode, go here. Make sure to subscribe at Reason's YouTube channel or wherever you listen to podcasts. Thanks for listening, watching, or both.